They're terribly long and terribly written. Good luck sitting through these. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 worst movie monologues. It seems to me like you're an expert, Mark. No, definitely not an expert, Johnny. For this list, we're looking at speeches or extended pieces of big screen dialogue that are over the top, poorly written, or just too long. But I've been shown through the wisdom of others that there is one more battle to be waged. They may also be poorly performed, they may make you cringe, they may be about a subject that isn't worth spending time on, or they may just be entirely out of place in the film, tone or content-wise. I present now my story, full of mystery and intrigue. Number 10. Snow White Needs a Brother – Snow White and the Huntsman Iron will melt, but it will writhe inside of itself. After she took on the role of Bella in Twilight, it's hard to describe Kristen Stewart as a revered Hollywood actress. She did nothing to enhance her reputation in this retelling of the classic fairy tale. All these years, all I've known is darkness. But I have never seen a brighter light than when my eyes just opened. Best described as safely generic, the rallying cry in question comes just after Snow White wakes from a slumber induced by Queen Ravenna's poison apple. However, by the look on Snow's face, she's still half asleep. I will become your weapon! Forged by the fierce fire that I know is in your heart! Aside from raising the volume of her voice, Stuart is as wooden as ever, barely looking anything more than mildly displeased at the oppression she suffered her whole life. And who will ride with me? Who will be my brother? We all thought Bella was gone after Twilight concluded, but this is all too reminiscent of that moody teenager. You're asking me about the weather? Number 9. The most confusing opening ever, Zardoz. I am Arthur Frayne, and I am Zardoz. Feeling like an abstract Monty Python sketch rather than the opening of a fantasy flick, Zardoz's floating head bounces around the screen, rambling about God and the entertainment business. Well, at least we think that's what's going on. It's not entirely clear. In this tale, I am a fake god by occupation and a magician by inclination. Just to compound your confusion, Zardoz's beard is drawn on with what seems to be a sharpie, and his headdress looks like it's made from a simple tea towel, leaving you wondering if the whole thing is one big mistake. And you, poor creatures, who conjured you out of the clay? Despite the fact that this is one of the most bizarre movie beginnings ever, it actually does a pretty good job of setting the tone for the rest of this hilariously corny flick, which also gives us the pleasure of seeing Sean Connery in a diaper. The gun is good. The gun is good! The penis is evil. Number 8. Guile's Speech – Street Fighter you're joking. He may not have had much to work with, but the muscles from Brussels sure does a magnificent job of butchering pretty much every line in this typically abysmal video game adaptation. Troopers, I just received new orders. Our superiors say the war is cancelled. We know he can act. His monologue in JCVD was excellent, yet as Colonel Guile, he's nearly unintelligible and what you can understand is rendered accidentally hilarious thanks to his thick, supervillain-esque Belgian accent. Bison is getting paid off for his crimes, and our friends who have died here will have died for nothing. It's incredible that such a mediocre speech came from the likes of Stephen E. D'Souza, the same man who penned endlessly quotable hits from the 80s and 90s, like the first two Die Hard movies. I'm not going home. I'm gonna get on my boat, and I'm going up river, and I'm going to kick that son of a bitch bison's ass so hard that the next bison wannabe is gonna feel it. Though the speech may be hard to understand, at least it sounds vaguely motivational. So he deserves a small cheer for that. No, who wants to go home? And who wants to go with me? Number seven. Colin Firth's generic final speech, The Last Legion. My friends, we've all seen many mornings like this one. Colin Firth has often been typecast as a suave, dashing English gent. And after his role as General Aurelius in the Roman army, you'll understand why. Together we've watched the sun rise and not known if that day would be our last. 
Some comrades I've seen scarcely out of boyhood trembling before their first battle. This movie is loosely based on the story of the demise of the Western Roman Empire, except there's barely a sliver of originality in any scene, which is demonstrated by this rousing speech. Honestly, you could stick this passage of dialogue in literally any war movie. Together we have fought all our lives for the empire that our ancestors created, and together we have watched that empire crumble to dust. Firth, to his credit, gets a little worked up. But as a viewer, you can actually see all the mandatory elements for such a speech being ticked off. Swelling music? Check. Through the wisdom of others that there is one more battle to be waged. Call to action? Check. Let us defend to the last breath this island of Britannia against those who would tear out its heart and soul. Punchy catchphrase? Check. That there was such a thing as a Roman soldier with a Roman sword and a Roman heart. You've seen all these tropes before, and after this snooze fest, you can only pray that you'll never have to suffer through them again. Hail Caesar! Hail Caesar! Number six, Rocky solves the Cold War, Rocky IV. I came here tonight, and I didn't know what to expect. The Italian stallion usually inspires us through acts of sheer physical will and awesome montages though he never quite sets the world on fire with his verbal eloquence. However, after defeating the steroid-enhanced Ivan Drago and turning a previously partisan USSR crowd to his side, Rocky uses the platform he has to give a slurring speech imploring everyone, including members of the Politburo, to unite and move on from Cold War animosity. During this fight, I've seen a lot of changing. In a film rammed with kitschy moral lessons, this contrived final speech written by Sylvester Stallone himself attempts to turn Balboa into some sort of social arbiter, when three films before this he could barely spit out Adrian coherently. Adrian! What do you think about when the 15th round you're coming out? Adrian! Let your fists do the talking next time, Rocky. If I can change, and you can change, you can change. Everybody can change! Number five, Mark Wahlberg's awkward flirting, The Happening. What? No. Oh, M. Night, what happened? How can the same guy who gave us the sixth sense come up with this tripe? I see dead people. Throughout this thriller slash unintentional comedy, there are a number of horribly written passages of dialogue. It's the plants. They can release chemicals. You like hot dogs, don't you? Yet the one we've chosen is by far the worst. If we're gonna die, I want you to know something. I was in a pharmacy a while ago. There was a really good looking pharmacist behind the counter. Trying to get back at his wife for going out for a tiramisu with another guy, yes, it's that specific, Mark Wahlberg's character Elliot confesses that he nearly spent $6 on cough syrup just to talk to a cute pharmacist. I went up and I asked where the cough syrup was. I didn't even have a cough. And I almost bought it. In a perfect storm of awful, Wahlberg's famously perma-surprised performance combines with Shyamalan's horrendous script writing in what could well be one of the hardest scenes to watch in film history. Are you joking? Number four, trivializing assault, The Room. What's new with you? Well, I'm just sitting up here thinking, you know? Watching Tommy Wiseau's disaster of a romantic drama these days is a bewildering guilty pleasure for many, and it's scenes like this that fans love. I got a question for you. Yeah. You think girls like to cheat like guys do? What makes you say that? Let's all stop and marvel at Wiseau's complete and utter lack of understanding of the craft. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! As with the rest of the film, there's something slightly off with how casually Mark talks about a woman being hospitalized by an angry partner. I used to know a girl. She had a dozen guys. One of them found out about it, beat her up so bad she ended up in a hospital on Guerrero Street. <laughs> The delivery is fine-ish, yet the script is so oblivious to the seriousness of the subject it's trying to examine that the viewer and Johnny can't help but laugh inappropriately. What a story, Mark. <laughs> what a story, Mark. Number three, Mickey Rourke's musings on life, The Expendables. You know, man, we don't stand for shit. We used to, but that dried all up like this is gonna dry all up. What filmgoers wanted from this orgy of testosterone-fueled action stars was ridiculous carnage interspersed with corny one-liners. Not shoehorned character development that's desperately trying to paint this mix of mercenaries as tortured souls. You remember that time we was up in Bosnia? We took down them Serb bad boys? 
Rourke, as Tool, ponders how war has destroyed him as a human being, even churning out the old cliché about the possibility of saving his soul had he actually stopped a woman from committing suicide. She looked at me, and I knew she was going to jump. You know what I did, man? I just turned around and I kept walking. You might have thought this hammy attempt at creating a sympathetic character would spark a change in Stallone's Barney, but no. His whole squad carries on, happily raining down wanton destruction. It might be pointless for the plot, but it's the perfect time for the moviegoer to go to the bathroom or make him or herself a drink. If I'd have saved that woman, I might have... I don't know, saved what was left of my soul, you know? Number 2. Hitting on a Criminal – Gigli You know something? You're right. It is sadness. Sounding like a rant that might come from a stereotypical frat boy, the titular Larry Gigli uses a number of childish colloquialisms to bemoan the fact that he's not able to have fellow criminal Ricky. You know why I'm fucking sad? Because I got this fucking beautiful, sexy, gorgeous, heartthrobberama, fucking smart, amazing bombshell 17 on a. 10 scale girl sleeping in a bed right next to me. Unbelievably, Ricky doesn't even react when Gigli labels her a stone cold dyke and Dykosaurus rexi. Remaining mute, blank faced, and surprisingly unoffended by such terms. She's a stone cold dyke. A fucking untouchable, unhavable, unattainable brick wall fucking Dykosaurus rexi. The scene is designed to show Gigli's soft innards sneaking through his hard exterior, but the mysterious absence of chemistry shown by Benefer means you might completely miss the fact that this is Gigli opening up about his feelings. Hmm. Also, you'd never guess they were dating at the time. Not only is she a major babe, but I really like this girl a lot. Okay, but seriously, who says heartthrobarama in real life? Jeez. Oh, and in case you're interested, my life sucks. Before we unveil our number one pick, here are some honorable mentions. There's a part of him that wants to, Jimmy. A part deep inside himself that sounds a warning. But there's another part that needs to know. Your simplicity long ended when you took Persian mistresses and children, and you thickened your holdings with plunder and jewels! Number one, Anakin dislikes sand. Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. Here everything is soft and smooth. George Lucas arguably did such a stinking job telling Darth Vader's origin story that it's tough to decide if the brat from The Phantom Menace is better or worse than the angsty teen he later becomes. Are you an angel? What? While in Naboo with Padme, Anakin awkwardly comes up with a line that even a 14-year-old on their first date would be embarrassed about. I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. Hayden Christensen is stiff and creepy when wooing the former queen. He stares, strokes, and bites his lip, which we can only assume are moves from Anakin's warped point of view, and he seems to think they're more effective than a Jedi mind trick. It might be shorter than many of the monologues on this list, but the sand speech is unrivaled in terms of sheer density when it comes to horrendous meme-worthy content. If Master Obi-Wan caught me doing this, he'd be very grumpy. Do you agree with our list? Which meandering piece of film dialogue can you not bear to sit through? Thank you. For more entertaining top tens published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. Is it some secret? No, Tell me, forget it. I'll talk to you later. Well, whatever.